uh, a new theory of origins, which it, it really is a new theory of origins. Uh, some of the things that I've come to the conclusion about have never been suggested before. For example, that the wood of Folklu existed in Brittany and not in, in Connacht in the west of Ireland. But uh, we'll look at these things tonight. And I'm going to use a PowerPoint with some, some of the texts so that you can re we can refer to those. We're basically going to be evidence-driven. I'm going to try and give you a, a summary of, of some of the basic evidence that we find in the old manuscripts. And I've got my own views about it. After studying it for five years, reading as many books as I could, um, I've come to my own conclusions. But this evening, I'm not here to, to, to foster my conclusions on you. I'm, I'm here to invite you to look at the evidence and draw your own conclusions and make up, make up your own mind. Um, I'll never forget being in Washington, D.C. about five years ago when I began research for this book. I was at a St. Patrick's Day party in Washington, D.C. And I met someone there called Jack O'Sullivan. Uh, and when I got talking to him, I'd never met him before, I asked him what he did for a living. And he said he worked for the intelligence communities in Washington. And I was intrigued by that. I wasn't sure what more I could ask him because I know that those people can't talk about their work very openly. But I did ask him to, to give me as much information as he could, and he did that. And, uh, and, and he, said, he told me that his job was to teach intelligence agents, spies in other words, CIA spies. His job was to teach the CIA agents how to write better reports. And I was intrigued by that. I said, Jack, how do you teach them to write better reports? And he said, I, I have a maxim, he said. And this is the maxim that I try to teach them. Just because somebody tells you that something is true doesn't mean it necessarily is true unless there is sufficient evidence to support what they're saying. Just because somebody says something is true and it appears on the front page of a newspaper, doesn't mean it necessarily is true unless there is sufficient evidence to support it. And I think that maxim can guide all of us in our quest uh, for the historical St. Patrick, um, and certainly it, 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 it can guide you in any of the comments I make about Patrick. Now, uh, just to begin, um, I haven't brought notes with me to give out, but if any of you want a copy of this little PowerPoint which has some quotations on it, you're very welcome to have that uh, freely. Uh, I'll perhaps give a copy to Tim. You can take a copy of the PowerPoint. And if any of your friends would like that, you can email it to them or something. Would you, would you like that? Okay. So let's have the first slide, uh, Tim, please. Historic controversy. Now, I, I'm a bit concerned that some of you on this side can't see the writing. Is that a problem for you? Or are you okay with that? Okay. You're okay with it? All right. Just tell me if I'm in the way and I'll, I'll move out of the way. There is a historic controversy, as you know, about this subject, as to where St. Patrick came from. Some say Britain. Most, most scholars hold fast to the traditional view that St. Patrick came from Britain. And that when he mentions a Latin word, Britannis, in his confession, that that Latin word refers to Britain in the plural form, the Britons. <clears throat> Some say Scotland, Strathclyde. Others say Cumbria, others say Wales, the Valley of the Severn River, some even say Glastonbury in England. But nevertheless, mainstream scholarship holds fast to that view. Even the Royal Acad Irish Academy in Dublin, on its website today, of St. Patrick's Confession, translates Britannies as in Britain. And uh, I haven't read it recently, but up until last year, there were no qualifying remarks in the footnotes. In other words, the Royal Irish Academy supports that traditional view. I personally disagree with it, and for reasons which I will give. Here's a lovely quote from a Scottish uh, antiquarian, Mr. Tuckner. In 1872, he said this. I think it's a wonderful uh, quotation. He says, the personality, birthplace, and mission of St. Patrick constitutes a link between ourselves and our sister island. He's speaking from Scotland, by the way. And he's, the sister island is Ireland. Uh, constitutes a link with our sister island, appealing to the deepest sympathies of religion and consanguinity 
which I, sh I would be loath to, to see dissevered, and which I hope, therefore, may resist the rudest assaults of sceptical criticism, although this and every other consideration must give way to the voice of truth. It is impossible that all of which has been handed down to us as to the existence and actions of such a personage should be a mere fiction, that a nation should have been deceived as to the most important event of its history, the introduction of Christianity, and, a ma and the man who was the principal instrument in the work, or that it should have made itself, either voluntarily or involuntarily, the agent of deception. St. Patrick has an abiding presence whose memory is in the hearts of millions. And with his spirit, we may still hold communion through the literary remains, scanty as they are, which he has bequeathed to us. That was J.H. Tuckner in 1872. Next one, please, Tim. Just an image of St. Patrick. You all recognise that, don't you? Yes. Where is it from? Soldier. Uh, so if you didn't know that, shame on you, living here in Dan Patrick. That wonderful Evie Hone stained glass window in Saul Church, and I love it. She's very famous for her stained glass windows because of the facial, the facial hair. She hand painted all the facial hair. But I, I love this image of St. Patrick because you've got the River Slaney there, you've got Patrick with the halo around his head, and the, the cross, which is very similar to the Patrick's cross in the museum here in Dan Patrick. You've got the Bacali Sioux, the staff of Jesus, and then you've got the boat that brought him back to Ireland as an apostle, parked there, in, moored there in the River Slaney. And it's a St. Patrick, he's not wearing a mitre and a chasuble and all those, all those ecclesiastical vestments that didn't come into Ireland until the 12th century with the Norman invasion. He's wearing simple Celtic cloth clothes. And it's a lovely down-to-earth image of Patrick. There's wonderful, wonderful compassion in his eyes. Uh, so that Evie home win window has always spoken very deeply to my heart, and I love it, and I'm sure you do too. Okay. This is a little chateau in Brittany in France, and this is where really my, my story begins, and it's, it's, it's a story which changed the whole course of my life. Um, about, about six years ago... About six years ago, I was designing a pilgrimage in France, in Brittany. I wanted to take a group of Americans to go and see Mont Saint-Michel and Saint-Malo and all the Celtic megalithic standing stones in Brittany. So I was over in Brittany researching. I had no idea that St. Patrick had any connections with Brittany, even though I'd read lots of books on St. Patrick, and even though I'd been to all the Patrick sites in Ireland. Brittany was about something else. And the friend I was researching with, we, we'd been working hard, we needed a day or two off work to celebrate a Jubilee birthday. Uh, I booked this accommodation online about two weeks before, at the last minute, simply to have a break from work and celebrate this birthday. It wasn't expensive, it was a sort of a small little chateau. Uh, it looked good at the right price. And when I entered the chateau there, uh, I was a little disappointed. It wasn't like a French chateau should be. It wasn't extravagant, it wasn't very well kept, it was a bit run down. But it was an intriguing place. And as I went into the room to prepare for dinner and getting dressed for dinner, I noticed a piece of paper on the table in the room. And just in French and English, it said, a petite histoire de le château, a, a short history of the château. And uh, it's a wonderful ancient site. You enter along this door driveway. There's a sort of a, a, it's like a bit like the temple in Jerusalem. There's a stepped walls there. And it's a big lake around it. And even at the end of the 18th century, it was surrounded by water. All this area was covered with water and under sea. Uh, just show me the next side and uh, see if it's got it written. OK, yes. The piece of paper that I picked up off the table, I started to read it. The name of the chateau was Chateau de Bonabon. And I just picked a piece of paper up and I started reading it. And this is what it said. The first castle, or rather fortress, that was built here dates from the late Roman period during the fourth century. At that time, this place was called Bonavena 
or Bonavis de Tiberio. It belonged to a Scottish prince, Calpurnius, who had come here to avoid Saxon forces who were invading Britain. One night, Irish pirates arrived in nearby Cancal. They spread through the forest of Coquund, which stretched under Guinier Bonabon as far as Plegué. Armed with pikes and axes, they slaughtered the prince and all his family. His property was looted and the castle burned to the ground. Only his youngest son, Patrice, survived from this slaughter. He was taken captive to Ireland. There he looked after sheep and learned the language of the country of which he was to become the oracle and the disciple. Now, you can imagine when I read that, I, my heart just stopped. I had to read it several times just to process the enormity of what was being said. And I asked myself the question, could this be... This place that I booked on the internet by chance and hadn't heard of before, could this be the place where St. Patrick once lived and where he, from which he was taken captive? Because that's what the local tradition claims. And the next day, my friend and I cancelled all our programme. We went into Saint Malo, the nearest large town, looking for books and evidence to support this local tradition. And someone once asked a question, how do you change the course of a river? How do you change the course of the river? And the answer is, you place a pebble at its source. Well, this piece of paper that I picked up, this local tradition, was the pebble that was placed at the source of the river of my life. And it changed the whole of course of my life for the next five years, as I read every book I could find on St. Patrick, to try and follow the evidence and see if there was any evidence to support these local claims in Brittany. Next one, please, Tim. So let's just look at a map of Britain during the late Roman period. You have, uh, in the far north, Caledonia, Scotland. There was a, uh, a region called Valencia, which didn't flow. This is Hadrian's Wall up at the top here. Then you have Maximus Caesarensis, Flavia Caesarensis, Britannia Prima, and Britannia Secunda in Wales. And then you have Ireland, and Hi which the Romans called Hibernia. Strathclyde is right up there above Hadrian's Wall, as you well know, modern-day Glasgow, basically. But then we have this intriguing little area here, uh, Brittany. And nobody really knows where, what, well, we know where the name Brittany came from, but there is controversy as to when the name changed to Brittany. But the Bretagne in French, Brittany in English, it is directly derived from the Latin uh, name Britannia, from Britannia. So, uh, basically, the historical context for that local tradition that I discovered in Chateau de Bonabon. The historical context is this, and it goes back to the year 383, when the Roman legions in Britain were being led by a man called Magnus Maximus. Fascinating name. Magnus Maximus, it means the greatest of the great, if you like. Magnus Maximus. He was related to the House of Constantine, um, but he had married a Welsh princess called Ellen, and he was in charge of the Roman legions in Britain, and he was also uh, married into one of the highest royal families uh, in, in the, of the ancient Britons, who were Welsh, of course. The ancient Britons were Welsh. And Maximus led the legions up to Strathclyde and defeated the Picts for a while in 382. But then in 383, his soldiers hoisted Maximus on their shoulders, they dressed him in purple, and he made a bid to become Emperor of Rome. They crossed over from Britain on two fronts. Some of the uh, British forces landed at the River Rhine, and they went up to Trier, and where the palace of the emperor was in Trier, Valentin Valentinian uh, was the emperor with Gratian. Gratian was killed, Valentinian fled. Other forces crossed to Brittany and landed at the Roman port of Alet, which is now Saint-Malo. And from there, the forces of Maximus subdued Gaul and Spain. As I began researching in the French historical books, 
Most of the Breton historians claim that St. Patrick's father and his family lived in Strathclyde at that time, that St. Patrick's mother was French, of the Franks, but the father was Scottish, Irish-Scottish, which, and don't forget, Scotland was a Welsh kingdom at that time, so it's, Scotland didn't exist at that time, it was a Welsh kingdom by the Cornish and the ancient Britons. But the Carponius lived in Strathclyde, and that the family migrated from Scotland, Strathclyde, to Brittany as part of the rebellion of Magnus Maximus. And the Breton historians claim that it was from Brittany that St. Patrick was taken captive when the Irish pirates attacked his father's estate there. Let's have a look at the next one, please. Uh, this. Okay. There's the quotation from that American uh, person, Jack O'Sullivan, just to remind you of that. Okay, next one. So here are the key historical names that, are, that have remained uncertain for the last 1,500 years. These are names that Patrick mentions in his letters, in his confession. And scholars still don't know, well, they're not agreed. They don't agree where they are located. Banavum Tiberni, uh, Confession 1, that's, that's the, the place where Patrick tells us his father owned an estate from which he was taken captive. He tells us that. That's why I was so amazed when I saw that local tradition and it used the word Bonabon, Tiberio. I mean, you, I could see the similarity there. Britannis, that's the name, plural name, in Confession 23, Confession 32, and Confession 42. Three times in his confession, Patrick tells us that his homeland was in Britannis. That was his homeland. Was it Britain or was it Brittany? The Wood of Folklou, Confession 23. I was fascinated when I heard the story that the pirates kept through this forest of Coquelund because the names Folklou and Coquelund, Coquelund appeared similar to me. And in fact, Dr. David Paris, who's the professor of Old French in Trinity College in Dublin, when he came to the book launch in Dublin and sent me a lovely email, he said, I, he said Marcus, I think you've convinced me that Banavam Tiberni was in Brittany, he said. But the evidence you give for the Wood of Folklou is not so convincing, he said. But I hope this will help you. And he, he gave me a whole description of how words in, in, in the old French language were translated into Latin and then came over to Ireland and were translated into Irish. And he says that the forest of Coquelund would be written, that French Breton name would be written as Folklou in Ireland. Um, the Mari Occidentale, the Western Sea, Patrick tells us that the Wood of Folklou was beside the Western Sea. Uh, where, where is that located? Most scholars think it was the Atlantic off the west coast of Ireland because the Wood of Folklou is supposed to be in Connacht, in County Mayo. But the, the Mare Occidentale also applied to the sea off the coast of Brittany. Uh, fi finally, there's Galliese. Patrick mentions Galliese, which is the Gauls. So these are the historical place names. My, in this new theory of origins, which I provide, present as much evidence as I can to help you read it through, I am arguing that the ancient site of Chateau de, de Bonabon, which is not far from Saint-Malo in Brittany, between Saint-Malo and Mont-Saint-Michel on the coast there, that that is the ancient site where Banavum Tiverni was located, where Patrick's home was located, from which he was taken captive at the age of 16. I am arguing that Britannis, in the context of St. Patrick's Confession, in the three places where it's mentioned, refers to the country, region, we now call Brittany, rather than uh, the island of Britain exclusively. I'm arguing that the wood of Folklou can be identified with the ancient forest of Coquelund, through which the Irish pirates crept up before they attacked uh, the house of St. Patrick's father. And just imagine what that was like that night. I mean, the Breton historians say that everyone was killed except the young son, Patrick. It, that means that St. Patrick was, witnessed his mother and father being killed in front of him. And Patrick tells us in his confession that they, the pirates killed all the male and female servants in his father's house. So his father was obviously very wealthy, as well as being possibly from a noble family. But it must have been an awful traumatic experience for Patrick seeing his parents killed in front of him, being dragged off to Ireland as a slave. And maybe that trauma is what caused him to have that nightmare. Do you remember in his confession he talks about the nightmare when he 
he heard the voice of the Irish speaking to him, saying, we, we beg you, O holy youth, to come and walk once more amongst us. And Patrick says, I woke up feeling heartbroken. What was it about that dream, that nightmare that made him heartbroken? I think it was a memory. And don't forget, when he wrote the confession, he was an older man, so he's looking back on his life. The memory of what happened to him when he was a teenager, when he was abducted uh, from his father's house, witnessed his parents' death, and was basically child trafficked into Ireland. I mean, Patrick really should be remembered as the patron saint of victims of child trafficking, because that's exactly what he was. And he was a slave in Ireland for six years, from the age of 16 to 23, as you know. I also argue that the Mari Occidentale, which Patrick mentions in Confession 23, is a reference to the sea off the coast of France and Spain, not a reference to the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of County Mayo. Gallius obviously refers to Gaul. Okay, next one, please, Tim. The unknown apostle. In the 200 years following St. Patrick's death in 461 until the closing decades of the 7th century, it is, impossible, it is impossible to find any clear historical references to him or his writings. The St. Patrick we, we know today uh, fails to appear in any surviving historical records from this period. This remains an enigma, and... One of, the, one of the great unsolved mysteries of the life of St. Patrick. Um, Prosper's Chronicle, the Irish Penitentials, the letters of St. Columbanus, the writings of the Venerable Bede, the life of St. Germanus, all of those documents, entries in the Irish annals, are controversial and contradictory. Basically, the St. Patrick we know from the Confessio disappears off the radar of the church for 200 years after his death. Like a ship gone down in the Bermuda Triangle, there is no historical reference to him anywhere, in Ireland, Britain, or on the continent. And we've got to ask the question, why? Why was Patrick forgotten? Why were his letters taken off the shelves of the ecclesiastical bookshops of that day? And I am proposing in the book that possibly there were two or three reasons. One, that he was in conflict with the emerging diocesan church in Europe, which was basically being reformed from Rome. Patrick was in conflict with that. He declared himself to be an independent apostle almost in Ireland. But we know that he was in trouble with his seniors. Patrick doesn't tell us that he was forgiven. He wasn't exonerated. So that conflict with his seniors may well have led to estrangement, and Patrick decided to stay in Ireland. It could be he was rejected because of his theology, it could be he was rejected because of his political contacts, it could be he was rejected because of his connections to the Emperor Magnus Maximus, because the imperial authorities ruling in Europe deeply resented the British invasion. They called it a usurpation. They believed that Magnus Maximus was a traitor. And anyone associated with Magnus Maximus was considered a traitor. And they would, on the continent, they would never trust the British ever again after that. There is evidence in the genealogies to suggest that St. Patrick's father was related to Max Maximus, that they all belonged to a certain royal family, and therefore Patrick would have been closely associated with them too. And the other stuff that I came across in the research and this isn't new. You know, the, the, the Irish elders, in their ancient texts, you can see this in the ancient Irish annals, they say the elders declare that St. Patrick's ancestors were of the Jews, and that his ancestors left Jerusalem in AD 70 at the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. I've done research on that too. There's a whole chapter in the Bloodline book which argues very strongly that St. Patrick's ancestors were Jewish. Even though he became a Christian, he would have been a Jewish Christian, or Christian Jew, still following a lot of the Jewish law. If that is true, if St. Patrick had Jewish connections in his family, that would be another reason why, the, why he was excluded from history. Because the church, from the 5th century, especially the 4th century, to the 8th century, the church became very anti-Semitic. 
and anyone associated with the Jews was basically declared uh, persona non grata. Anyone associated with Pelagius was declared a heretic. And there are strong arguments to say that Patrick's uh, way of thinking, his theology, is, 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 is very closely akin to Pelagius rather than St. Augustine. This was a big political battle in the church at the time. Um, so, in fact, if, you, if you're interested in Pelagianism, which was this great heresy at the time, it didn't exist. Pelagianism didn't exist as a movement. When you see the word Pelagius or Pelagianism, just read ditto between the lines. It's a reference to early Irish, British, and Celtic Christianity. Early Irish, British, and Celtic Christianity. That includes Welsh Christianity, ancient British Christianity, and Scottish Christianity, as well as Irish Christianity. Celtic Christianity, and Breton Christianity, and Galician spirituality in Spain. And this was all branded as heretical by the Roman Church. And they made a very determined effort to destroy it. Patrick may have been one of the first to get caught up in that theological dispute of the 4th century. Next one, Tim, please. Mercury, our dear friends, why do we think that Patrick came from Britain? Well, we think that Patrick came from Britain because a very influential writer said that was true. And his name was Mercury, and he was a scribe in Armagh in 675 AD. He was commissioned to write a life of St. Patrick. Armagh, Armagh was the centre of the Romanising movement. They were trying to bring the Romanising Roman traditions into Ireland. Diocesan Roman traditions, not monastic Roman traditions. Um, and Merku was commissioned to write a biography. And basically, uh, this is what he says when he began to write this life of St. Patrick. And I want to share this with you, because I think it's a fascinating quotation dated to 675 CE, where Merku is being very honest intellectually with the task that he has at his disposal. If I take this out, can I walk a little bit with it? What have I got? A couple of, couple of feet? And then I won't have to stand over this mic. Um, I'll let it out for no, you. No, that's fine. That's plenty for me. That's, yeah. that's perfect, Tim. Okay. That's perfect. Great. That's much easier. To... Okay. Uh, my Lord Aid, he was the one that commissioned the book. Many have tried to bring certainty to the order of this narrative according to what their fathers and those who were from the beginning servants of the word have handed down to them through, though because of this most difficult work of narration and the different opinions and very great suspicions of so many persons, they have never managed to achieve consensus or certainty with regard to an agreed history. For that reason, unless I am deceived, according to this proverb of ours, as boys are led out into the amphitheater, we have found ourselves being led through this deep and dangerous sea of holy narration, where there are very violent eddies and whirlpools, uncharted waters never tamed or brought to order by any previous craft except by my father, Cogitosus. Cogitosus wrote a life of St. Bridget. I have taken this initiative now with something tried and appropriated, the infant sailing boat of my own little intellect. But just in case I am accused of fashioning something great from something small, know that I am working without sufficient literary sources. Authors who cannot be identified dependent on unreliable memories and the bad language that characterizes this controversial subject. I do this with pious affection and holy charity, obedient to the command of your holiness and authority, even though I may be feeling weighed down with great uncertainty, I shall now take steps to unfold a few of the many deeds of Holy Patrick. That was Mercury in the 7th century. And basically, he, he created a map and he basically said that Patrick came from Britain. But we, we now think that he may have been guessing and that he actually didn't know exactly where Patrick came from. Okay, next one, Tim, please. Um, he was a hagiographer, and hagiography is not history. 
Hagiography is a particular genre of medieval literature. Hagiographers cannot be viewed as reliable historical witnesses. Hagiographers were basically ecclesiastical spin doctors. And for political reasons, which was the relationship between Ireland and the English, because the Anglo-Saxons were in Strathclyde about to invade Ireland, it suited Merku and it suited Armagh to present Patrick as British because it helped to protect Ireland from what seemed like an imminent uh, British invasion, English invasion. Um, the Armagh Canon is one of the numerous forgeries by means of which, in the course of the 7th century, the community of Armagh sought to buttress its claim to supremacy over all the other monastic federations in Ireland. In other words, there's a lot of dirty politics going on. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Um, okay, next one, please. Was it ignorance, or was it there a deliberate deception? Merkin provides no historical evidence to remember Jack O'Sullivan's maxim. Just because somebody says something is true doesn't mean it necessarily is true unless they provide evidence and support. Merkin provides no historical evidence to support his claim that Patrick came from Britain. He closes his narrative, however, with a very interesting reflection on illusions or delusions. First, he mentions stories related to illusions that can be found in the Bible, and then he concludes his life of St. Patrick by saying, so also this delusion was arranged to secure concord between the people. The Latin word he uses is seductio, which can mean leading astray, a delusion or deception. Was Merku trying to tell us something? Was he admitting between the lines, so to speak, that his presentation of St. Patrick was a delusion arranged to secure concord between the peoples? Many scholars believe now believe that to be true, particularly David Haller. Two conflicts had to be resolved. In Ireland, there were the Hibernensi and the Romani that were fighting each other. The Hibernensi wanted the old Irish traditions of St. Columba and St. Bridget. The Romani wanted the new traditions of Rome that were coming in from the continent. In the end, Armagh won, the Romani won, and Rome, uh, Ireland became Romanized at that period in the seventh century. And the Columban foundations were basically, it was the beginning of the end for, for St. Columba and the Irish tradition. Okay, next one please, Tim. The other conflict that they had to resolve, of course, was between the Anglo-Saxons and Ireland because the English were about to invade Ireland at the end of the 7th century. But because the life of Patrick was published, Ireland managed to avoid that conflict, and for some reason Ireland was able to retain its independence. So in many ways, Merkel was a genius, operating not just for the Irish church, but also for the Irish chieftains, and protecting, protecting Ireland from, from an English invasion at that time. Now, to get to the truth of it, you've got to read a lot. And there's a wonderful book by Father John Colgan, who was a Franciscan scholar. It's called Trias Thaumaturga. It was published in 1647 in Louvain, in Belgium. And it includes an appendix on the homeland and family of St. Patrick. <coughs> and what we find about this book that makes it so fascinating is that Merku couldn't monopolize the material. Other, other, um, other, Manuscripts had survived, other documents had survived on the continent, which tell a very different story. And let's look at a couple of those now. Next, please. There were those who followed Merku in the ancient lives of St. Patrick. For example, St. Felix Hymn said St. Patrick was born in Nenthor, and that's identified as Strathclyde in Scotland. The second, third, and fourth lives of St. Patrick, published by Colburn, repeat Merku's claims, and they follow Merku completely. Colgan's Sixth Life, written in the 12th century by Jocelyn. You know all about him because he wrote that life in, in Chabby, just around the corner. That also follows Merku, but Jocelyn even goes further and names, um, names uh, Britain very much as St. Patrick's homeland and where St. Patrick was taken captive from. These documents all supported Merku or they followed Merku, but there were others that told a very different story. Next. The Fifth Life of St. Patrick, written by Colgan. Now, some people date this to the 8th century, 9th century, we're not sure exactly when, but Pro Probus says something very different. This is what Probus said. 
St. Patrick, who was also called Soche or Suka, was a Briton by nationality, in which nation also having suffered many misfortunes in his youth, when he was taken captive, he was fashioned for the salvation of his whole tribe and fatherland. This man was born in Brittany. Probus says it very clearly. From his father Calpurnius, who was the son of Petitus the Elder. His mother's name was Conchetta. From the village of Banwal, in the region of Tiburni, not far from the Western Sea, Maria Occidentale, we have established beyond doubt that this village belonged <coughs> to the province of Neustria, in which giants are said to have lived. Now, here we have a writer that's not a hagiographer, really, but for the first time we have a historical reference. The province of Neustria was the ancient province of the Franks, which basically existed between Normandy and Brittany, as we know it today. So Probus is, and this is an 8th century, 9th century document on the continent. Probus is telling us that Patrick's Banavum Tiber and I was on the continent in Brittany, not on the island of Britain. Next, please, Tim. And this is the French connection. Here's where we begin to realize that there is a French connection. And for some reason, in all our education, we've been told very, very little about the French side of things. I suppose that's to be expected, isn't it? There's always been a, a great rivalry between Britain and France. Two great powers in Europe that have always been at loggerheads with each other. We feel the ghosts of Agincourt returning when we come to study Saint Pat the origins of St. Patrick, because scholars are as vehement in their nationalism with the British or the French thing as they are in their politics. And, and that's where sort of history gets affected, because one side or another writes the history. And I'd like to suggest to you that probably quite a lot of the history that we find in the history books and things we've been told about St. Patrick and his exclusively British connections uh, may not necessarily be the whole truth. And we have to dig a little bit deeper to realize that it's more than just the island of Britain. That Patrick had connections further afield than that. Uh, the French connection. While he was, this is Probus again. While he was still in his homeland, Patria, with his father Calpurnius and his mother Conchessa, also with his brother Rukti and sister Mila, in their city Amuric, Amorica, great strife broke out in those parts. In a devastating attack on Amorica and other places round about it, the king of the Britannia slaughtered, came and slaughtered Calpurnius and his wife Conchessa. They led away captive their sons Patrick and his brother Rukti, together with their sister Mila. So here's, here's another text directly claiming that Patrick was taken captive from Brittany. The next one, please. Um, and finally, these, this name Amorica or Amoricaletha, it's linked to Aleth, which is Saint Malo. This text, um, they used to call it Lethania Britannia, that part of Brittany. This is the cause of the enslavement of Patrick and his father, Calpurnius, Conchessa, his mother, a daughter of Ochmus, and his five sisters, Lupert and Tigris and Leoman and Derirka and Cinnamon, and his brother, Senon. They all travelled from the Britons of Alclud, Strathclyde, over the Achaean Sea, southwards on a journey to the Britons of Armorica, that is, to the Latavian Britons, for there were relatives of theirs there at that time, and besides, the mother of the children, Conchessa, was of the Franks, and she was a close female relation of St. Martin. That was the time at which seven sons of Sectmaid, the king of Britain, were in exile from Britain. They made a fierce attack on the Britons of Amorica, where Patrick was with his family. They slew Calpurnius there, and they brought Patrick and Lupit with them to Ireland, and they sold them in Conal Merton, County Bees, and Patrick in the north of Dalriada in County Antrim. That's in the tripartite life of St. Patrick. Next one, please, Tim. So here's just a map to help you locate these places. Um, this is the coast of Brittany. We have Mont Saint-Michel here. I'm sure some of you know where that is. We have Saint-Malo, which is Aleth over there. Aleth is the ancient name for Saint-Malo. Then you have Cancale, it's still a fishing port. Chateau Bonabon is over on that side of the bay. The ancient forest of Coquelund was here. Uh, Dol de Bretagne is the town, lovely medieval town, if you ever get a chance to visit Dol. It's the ancient ecclesiastical capital of Brittany. Fabulous place to visit. 
lots of connections with St. Patrick. And this is, this is the coastline today, um, but the coastline at the time of St. Patrick was up there because the sea has inundated this region. So this whole area was the ancient forest of Falklandia. This is where I believe St. Patrick's father lived after he moved to Brittany from Scotland. And this is where St. Patrick, uh, in my view, this is where St. Patrick was taken captive from. If you get a chance to visit Bon Amor, they, they've set up a local community there called the Memoir St. Patrick, and they believe that St. Patrick uh, was taken captive from their village. And they're wonderful Breton people, full of Celtic culture, and they love to see you if you visit them. Next one, please, Tim. Um, okay, we don't need to go into deeper ones on this. Let's move on. Let's move on. There's a little picture of the forest of Coquelin, which you can visit today. We've got a lovely Marion Grotto there. They've built a lovely Marion Grotto. And the Memoir Saint Patrick, uh, we've done some fundraising and we're going to put up a little statue or commemorative plaque uh, in that forest to mark the place where we believe Saint Patrick was taken captive. Because obviously, you know, you have to pray for the healing of memories too. He, he was taken captive there. He saw his parents die there. He saw his family home destroyed there. There was a lot of violence and a lot of, I mean, these Celtic Irish pirates were not members of the Salvation Army. It, was, it would have been an awful experience uh, that day when he was taken captive. So we're going to put a plaque up there for pilgrims to visit. Next one. Um, okay, don't worry, this is about the Mari Accidentale. We, we've done that. Let's move on. Okay, Patrick's royal family. We'll, we'll bring this to a closure with this. This is something Keating, an Irish historian called Keating, wrote in 1908. Uh, it's Keating's History of Ireland in the Irish Text Society, published in Dublin. Um, Keating believed that Patrick was taken captive by members of the family of King Nile of the Nine Hostages, who was King of Tara at that time. And that they were basically raiding the coasts of Britain, which we know is true, and also raiding the coasts of France. Uh, Keating records, and the Irish annals record, that King Niall, Niall of the Nine Hostages, was actually killed by a poisoned arrow while he was sailing on the River Loire in, in Brittany. And Keating believed that it was on one of these raids that Patrick was taken captive. So we do have some historians, quite a few, that support the Brittany theory. Uh, Keating says, um, he, King Niall of the Nine Hostages, sent a fleet to Brittany in France, which is called Armorica, for the purpose of plundering that country. They brought 200 noble youths as captives to Ireland, and it was in this captivity that they brought Patrick, who was 16 years of age. What's interesting about that is not just the mention that it was nine of the nine hostages, but it's the fact that he mentions that they were all noble youths that they were searching for. And this raises the whole question, which is very interesting, about whether St. Patrick belonged to a royal family. Next, please. Um, that's a, just another map of that area, which the Breton historians have done. This whole area where I believe St. Patrick was taken captive from. This is all in the book, so if you want, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint to look at it in more detail, you're, you're welcome to have one. Let's move on, though, because time is short. That's the picture of the chateau. Go on. Okay, um, where was St. Patrick trained? The, the missing years, we call them. Some sources say it was with Pope Celestine, Rome, Auxerre, Germanus of Auxerre, Lorraine, and that's Merkin telling us that. There are other sources that say he was trained in the community of St. Martin of Tours, then with a group of barefoot hermits, barefoot hermits in the Isles of the Turin Sea, which we believe was near Mont Saint Michel, and that we, he was ordained as a priest or bishop to come to Ireland by a Saint Senior on Mont Saint Michel. That's Provost again. So there are, this is the two Patricks. You know, we don't know. Um, my view would be that the latter, though all those at the bottom are true of Patrick. All those at the top are true of, of Pelagius, not Patrick. Okay, next one. Um, yes, let's move on. I don't want to go into too much detail with that. Let's move on. There's a picture of Mont Saint Michel. Have you any of you visited there? Yeah. One or two? Fabulous place. If you get a chance to go on pilgrimage, you can. There's a Benedictine Abbey at the top, and um, it's a quite developed now with all the shops and the abbeys and everything. But at the time of St. Patrick, it was a very simple place, 
And some of the ancient texts, like Probus, uh, claim that Patrick was ordained on this mountain in preparation for his mission to Ireland, and that the bishop that ordained him was called Saint Senior. Patrick, in his confession, mentions that his leaders in his church were called seniors. And there's a, still a parish near Mont Saint Michel in Avranche, which is called the Parish of Saint Senior. He's, he's remembered as the founding apostle of that part of Brittany. Next. Um, the staff of Jesus, this is an interesting one. This one's worth following. Um, while he was on Mont Saint Michel, Patrick is said to have been given a staff. And this is fascinating. Those of you that are interested in the religious side of it, this is the ancient story that's been passed on from, from centuries ago. When Patrick went to sea, nine was his number. And it was then that he came to the island and saw the new house and the young married couple inside. In front of the house, he saw a decrepit old woman on her hands. What is wrong with this old woman? Patrick asked. Great is her feebleness, the young man replied. She is my granddaughter. But if you could see her mother, she is even more feeble. How did this come to pass, said Patrick? Not hard to answer, said the young man. We have been here since the time of Christ, who came here and dwelled amongst us. We made a feast for him. He blessed our house, and he blessed us, but that blessing did not come upon our children. Because of this blessing, we shall abide here without aging or decay until the day of judgment. The young man said to Patrick, and this is the important thing about the story, the young man said to Patrick, your coming to us has been foretold for a long time. God left us with knowledge and understanding that you would be the one to come and that you would preach to the Gaels, the Irish. He left this token with us, and that is his staff, and he said it was to be given to you. I will not take it, said Patrick, unless Christ himself gives me his staff. Patrick stayed three days and three nights with them and then went to Mount Hernon, Mount Mont Saint-Michel, in the neighborhood of the islands. And there the Lord appeared to him and told him to go and preach to the Irish and gave him the staff of Jesus. He said that it would be a helper to him in every danger and in every unequal conflict in which he should be. Now you know, as well as I know, that the, this staff, this Bacali Su, the staff of Jesus, was one of the greatest relics of Patrick in the Irish church. It was preserved in Armagh for centuries. It was eventually burned in Dublin at the time of the Reformation in 1642. But Bernard of Clairvaux, when he, he saw this staff and he said it was bedecked with gold and silver and jewels, but it was a simple wooden staff. Now, we can't prove it, there's no evidence to support this, but the legend, the story is very ancient and very strong. And it's, it says, basically, that this was a staff that was carried by Jesus Christ with his disciples, and that it was preserved on the continent and it was preserved to be given to the person that would carry the gospel of Christ to the ends of the earth. Remember in the gospels, Jesus tells his disciples to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, to the place where no one else dwells beyond. Well, if you read St. Patrick's Confession, in Patrick's Confession on several occasions, Patrick tells us that he has fulfilled that command of Jesus, that the gospel has now been preached to the ends of the earth. Because Ireland, at that time, was the ends of the earth, as far as the Romans were concerned. The Americas hadn't been discovered. They existed, but they hadn't been discovered. So the Romans believed that after Ireland, everything else was just dusk and darkness. It was the land of the setting sun. The world literally dropped off a precipice. Nothing there, except dusk and darkness. And Patrick tells us that the He's, in his confession, he says, now the gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth, and now the end will come. Patrick believed that the end of the world would now come, that there would now be the last judgment, because the gospel had been preached to the ends of the earth. Um, and he carried with him that staff. And I just want you to ask the question, it doesn't matter what you believe one way or the other, they called it the Bacali Su, the staff of Jesus. What if that's true? We have no evidence to support it. But what if it is possibly true that there was a staff carried by Jesus, that it was preserved, 
It was carried to the ends of the earth by the followers of Jesus and then by Patrick. If there is any truth in that story, then the Irish church possessed one of the most priceless relics of the whole of Christianity. And it would be more priceless than the Book of Kells or the Book of Armagh or St. Patrick's Bell or any of the other relics of St. Patrick. Because that staff would have been carried by Patrick like it was carried by all the archbishops of Armagh in its day. But more than that, that little wooden staff would have been carried in the hands of Jesus Christ himself. To me, that's a fascinating legend. And I would love to be able to find evidence uh, connecting it further. Okay, next one, Tim, please. We'll draw this. Just to end with St. Patrick's royal family, a lot of the research I did suggested that Patrick belonged First of all, it was linked to the kings of Scotland, um, who were linked to the kings of Ireland, because as you know, Scotland and Northern Ireland were one kingdom at that time. Uh, at the time of St. Patrick, there was the kingdom of Dalriada, Dalriada, which existed on both sides of the Irish Sea. It exi existed in County Antrim and County Down, a bit north of here, um, and it also existed in the highlands and islands of Western Scotland. And I think um, that Calpurnius's name is linked to the Calpins. Patrick, in Scotland, Patrick is remembered as Patrick MacAlpine. So that's a link to the MacAlpine family, which, as you know, is a very important family in Scotland. All the ancient kings of Scotland belong to the MacAlpine, or the Calpin dynasty, who are linked to King Erk of Northern Ireland. So there's a connection there. And at that time, Scotland was a sort of a Welsh kingdom. Strathclyde was a Welsh kingdom. So we talk about the House of Wales and Brittany. These are the ancient British royal families that were part Welsh, part Scottish, uh, and also part Breton. And I'll just show you one genealogy that points to that. The next slide. Uh, can you see that? I, I can't see it very clearly. I'm going to come off mic just for a minute because I need to move. Uh. This is the House of Wales and Brittany, a very ancient royal house, which any, any royal genealogist will tell you about. You can, you can uh, study them in any of the universities. At the top, you have St. Helena, who was the wife of Constantine. And on this side, you have, so, uh, these are only main characters in the line of descent. You have Caradoc uh, in Wales, Conan, who, who was with Magnus Maximus. We're told that Conan married St. Patrick's sister, Derek. That's what we're told in the genealogies. So, in other words, one of St. Patrick's sisters married uh, someone who was of a royal line from Scotland, Wales, who became the first king in Brittany after that rebellion of Magnus Maximus. That their children were Istrafael uh, and Urbia. From those, we get to the, the second king in Brittany, Gralon. And Gralon married another sister of St. Patrick who was called Tigris, Tigris. Gralon married her. In other words, in the genealogies, two of St. Patrick's sisters married two of the first kings in Brittany who were related to the kings of Wales and Scotland and the ancient Britons. And they are linked directly to the kings of Strathclyde. Linked directly to the kings of Strathclyde. On the other side, you have uh, Magnus Maximus there, um, who was a cousin of Conan. If so, St. Patrick was related to him indirectly. And down this line, you come to all the early kings of Brittany, Solomon, Aldrian, down to Bude. And there are so many Jewish names in those Breton aristocratic lists, it suggests there was a very strong Jewish influence in, in, those, um, in those Merovingian times. Um, but it's fascinating that two of St. Patrick's sisters married into the kings. And, you know, the names themselves are fascinating. Darurka, St. Patrick's sister Darurka, that's a Celtic name. It comes from Dar, Derry, Derry, or Dara, the oak, means oak. Dar, Urca. Urca was the king of, of, of Northern Ireland, very famous king in Northern Ireland, from which the MacAlpins are descended in Scotland. So you have Dar, Urca. It means basically daughter of the oak of Urk. Daughter of the oak of Urk. And it's shown that, that Calpurnius and Conchessa chose the names for their children very, very carefully and they belong to a royal family. St. Patrick's other sister, Tigris, comes from Tigri in Gaelic. Tigri, the house of kings. Tigri. It doesn't mean 
Tigris in Latin. Tigris in Latin means a little tiger. I'm sure she was a little tiger, actually. But Tigri gives you, the, it's the Gaelic name that takes you back to the early beginnings, the origins of the name. Tigri means from the House of King. And then the cin cinema, they called her Royal Sin in Ireland. So there's a third member of St. Patrick's family who's said to have royal status. Calpurnius was said to have been a Scottish prince. We encountered that in the Breton story right at the beginning of this presentation. Calpurnius, St. Patrick's father, was a Scottish prince. The name of St. Patrick's mother, Conchessa, it can be linked to the word Countess, so maybe she had some royal blood too. But the biggest name on top of the list, of course, is Patrick himself, isn't it? Patrick himself. In his confession, Patrick tells us, I sold my royal title for the benefit of others. I sold my royal title for the benefit of others. It's in St. Patrick's Confession. Um, so it's St. Patrick's Confession, his letter, which provides the best evidence of all to suggest to us that Patrick belonged to a very important royal family. And he gave it all up to become a Christian apostle, to become a Christian evangelist. And a lot of them did that. St. Columba was of a royal family. He gave that up to become a, a, a Christian leader in the monastery of Iona. So many of the early Irish monks belonged to royal families, but they gave it all up to follow the teachings of Jesus. So we shouldn't be surprised that the same happened to Patrick. Next, please, Tim. There's not much left now. These are the early kings of Brittany, according to the Breton historians. Conan, at the time of St. Patrick, 383, married St. Patrick's sister, Derocca. Rallon, 388 CE, married Patrick's sister, Tigris, or Dagris. Solomon was son of Gralon, so he was related to the family. The next king was Audren, uh, uh, who was son of Solomon. The next king was Budig. Then there was Hole, then there was Riathem, and then there was Hole and Rivola. Going all the way down to Alain, who was the last king of Brittany, they all traced their origins from Conan and Derurka. And these are uh, established genealogies. These are pieces of information. These provide pieces of information about St. Patrick, which for some reason, in Ireland and Britain, we have never been told. It's only the early Breton historians that have kept these records. And that's what makes the study of St. Patrick so fascinating. We've been told a lot, but there is also a lot that we haven't been told. And we have to ask the reasons why. Why were we not told? Why were, have we not been told that there were alternative accounts? There were alternative stories. The things we were told were true, weren't necessarily true, because there was no evidence provided to support them. But when you weigh up the evidence on both sides, and you read all the sources, the evidence, in my view, strongly tilts towards Brittany and the French connection. But my friends, my friends in Dan Patrick, no one need feel excluded in this new theory of origins for St. Patrick. It's new and it's not new. The Bretons have been talking about it for centuries. No one need feel excluded because it suggests that Patrick's family lived in Strathclyde, which we now call Scotland. But that at that time, Strathclyde was a Welsh kingdom. So the Scots are not excluded. The Welsh tradition is not excluded. But that Patrick's family moved to Brittany. And it was from Brittany that he was taken captive before he returned to Ireland. And that he belonged to a noble family of the ancient, fam uh, ancient Britons in, or the ancient Welsh in Brittany. That's a part of the story that we simply haven't been told. And that's what makes it a sort of a da Vinci code that we need to sort of ask a lot more questions and hopefully find out a lot more answers. Uh, but nobody excluded the Scots, the Welsh, the Irish, and the Bretons. Unfortunately, in our history books, the Bretons have been excluded. And it's time that their part in the St. Patrick story was recognized and respected. Okay, next one, please, Tim. This is St. Augustine, a wonderful quote from St. Augustine. I think he had a lot to do with the writing of history. Um, because there was a big conflict between St. Augustine and St. Jerome and Celtic Christianity, Celtic monasticism. St. Augustine once said, 
we ought not believe anything on a dubious point, lest in favour to our error we conceive a prejudice against something that truth hereafter will reveal. I love that quote because it's, it's it, let's read it again. We ought not to believe anything on a dubious point, lest in favour to our error we conceive a prejudice against something that truth hereafter will reveal. I do hope that if you get a chance to read this new book, book on St. Patrick, that you'll file, find little treasures of truth woven into the fabric of the narrative, and that those little treasures of truth, which you have to weigh up in your own mind, in your own conscience, with your own uh, judgment, weighing up the evidence, that it will help to add so much more to the story of St. Patrick than we have so far been told. Next, please, Tim. And that's just a quote from a Dohi Cronin, who's a, a very member of the Royal Irish Academy, a very strong teacher, wrote the book, A New History of Ireland. He says, the problem of St. Patrick can still be seen to bar the very portals of Irish history. I think what he's saying there is that this is an important subject, because this subject, St. Patrick, relates to the very beginning of Irish history. And therefore, we have a duty to explore it, not to take a prejudiced view, not to be tied to a theory if there is no evidence for it, but rather to be open to understanding the complexity of history, and therefore, perhaps, the complexity of the St. Patrick story. Next. OK. And I'll end on this, because it's a question of where was St. Patrick born. I've taken a personal view. I'm not suggesting you need to do that. It's just I didn't want to sit on the fence after reading all these books. I wanted to, to uh, take a view. It's not based on any real evidence. It's just based on all these old manuscripts. And you can't call them history because they were hagiography. But there is a lovely story in one of the ancient lives which says this. Uh, it says, this was the reason of the slavery of St. Patrick. His father, Calpurnius, and his mother, Concessa, daughter of Ocmusius, and his five sisters, Lupit, Tigris, Lamania, Derurca, and the name of the fifth Cinnamon, and his brother Senon, all travelled together from Alcludentian Britain, which is Strathclyde, across the Achaean Sea, which is basically the English Channel, in a southerly direction, for the sake of business, to Lethanian Amorica, Brittany, alias Lethacan Britain, in other words, Brittany was called Britain then, because in that place, was a certain relative of theirs. And, and this was the key for me, and because the mother of the expected offspring, that is to say, Concessa, was from France and a close relative of St. Martin of Tours. So there's your French connection. But there's a lovely clue in that if you're looking for clues. Who's named as the travellers? They're saying that, that the family went on a journey that they moved from Scotland to Brittany and they sailed by boat. The geography is, is, is authentic. The Achaean Sea is the name for what we now call uh, the English Channel, or the, just below Ireland, the sea below Ireland and Land's End. All the family are listed, the mother, the father, the children, the sisters, the brothers, but St. Patrick is not listed in the travellers. Look, he's not mentioned up there. He's not listed as any of the passengers on the boat. But at the very end, it just says, The mother of the expected offspring. It's in Latin. And it basically suggests that when the family made that journey, Concessa, St. Patrick's mother, was pregnant. And I'm, I, I've decided not to sit on the fence, but I'm proposing that when the family made that journey, which I believe is a historical context, St. Patrick was the child in her womb. That he, had, he was conceived in Scotland. He had been conceived in Scotland, but the family then travelled to Brittany, and he was born in Brittany, either at Tour, which is meant for, or, on, or at Banagum Tiberni, and that he was taken captive from Brittany, and that when he escaped from Ireland, after his slavery, he returned to Brittany to see members of his extended family. But isn't that lovely, the idea? That, to me, sort of reminds us of the adventure that surrounds St. Patrick. He began his life in the womb on a great adventure in his mother's womb, travelling from Scotland to Brittany. And the whole rest of his life 
was, a, in, in a way, an incredible adventure. Full of danger, full of strife, but also full of holiness and beauty. And bringing the gospel and shining the light of Christianity, lighting the light of Christianity in Ireland. St. Patrick's life was full of so much adventure and courage and perseverance and bravery. And for that, we must thank him. Next, uh, Tim, please. Okay. Um, just a timeline for you, a possible timeline, if you want to take this. 384, Patrick's family moved from Scotland to Brittany. 385, Patrick born in Brittany. 401, pa Patrick taken captive from Brittany, from Chateau Bonabar. 407, Patrick escapes from slavery in Ireland, returns to Brittany. 407 to 411, Patrick trained at St. Martin's Monastery near Tours. 411 to 420, Patrick undertakes some spiritual formation with those barefoot hermits near Mont Saint Michel. 420 to 427, Patrick continues training. 428, Patrick is ordained by St. Senior on Mont Saint Michel. 428, possibly Patrick returns to Ireland. I, I think he might have come a little bit before the 431 date, because 431, Palladius is sent to Ireland. Uh, that's the official Roman history. And St. Germanus is sent to Britain. So there was some politics going on at that time. 432 is the traditional date given for St. Patrick's coming to Ireland. 460, Patrick writes a letter to Caroticus. 461, Patrick writes the confession. And in that same year is the traditional date given for St. Patrick's death. Remember at the end of his confession, Patrick says, this is my confession before I die. When he finished writing his confession, he knew he was about to die. That's why I dated his death in 461 and not 492. Okay, I think there's one more slide, isn't there? Uh, Tim, please. Ah, John Barton Castle. Okay, look, we're into real mystery territory now. We, we're not sure where Patrick was born. We're not sure where he was taken captive from me. Where, where did he die? That's another thing we don't know. And I have a little personal theory on that. Not based on any evidence, but I believe that he was in conflict with King Caroticus in Strathclyde. This is the King's Castle in Strathclyde. And you know, after his letter to Caroticus, Patrick, that's, that letter is full of anger and full of grief. This king, Caroticus, had just sent soldiers to a little village just round the corner from where we are now, Saul Church, the barn in Saul. And those Scottish soldiers had attacked that church and killed people and then taken all the young converts over to Scotland. All the young girls, they still had the chrisms on their head dressed in white garments, taken them back to Scotland, and sold them, basically, sold them into prostitution amongst the pigs. And Patrick was furious about this, and he was brokenhearted. His whole congregation had been wiped out in the barn and all by this Scottish king. So Patrick wrote to that king, pleading for him to return those girls taken captive and return the things that he'd stolen. And Patrick gets very, very angry, and he basically says to that king, you will be damned for all time. You will be damned for all time if you do not make amends for your evil actions and return those young girls to us. You have turned Christ's church into a brothel. I wonder how that king reacted to that. A British king would not have taken very kindly to being spoken to in that way by an upstart Irish bishop. My own theory is that Patrick, because Patrick tells us he sent an elder over there to secure the girl's release, and, and that the king mocked those messengers and sent them back. I've got a feeling, with my, my knowledge of what Patrick, who Patrick was, that Patrick basically said, OK, I'm going to go and do it myself. And I think there's a possibility he may have gone over to Strathclyde to try and re re secure the release of the, cap the girls taken captive during that raid on the barn of Saul. And if he did go over to secure their release, it is highly likely, because Caroticus was a British warlord, a very violent man, it is highly likely that Patrick could have been martyred in the palace in Strathclyde. And maybe, uh, we'll never know the truth of where he died or how he died, but um, he certainly knew that death was Im imminent, didn't he? When he wrote his confession, he said, this is my confession. Last slide, I think, is the blessing one. Tim, please. 
just flip through them. Oh, there's an old picture of Patrick. The St. Patrick of Ancient Ages. Look at him. That's the front cover of the book. Okay. This is Chateau. Sorry, could you go back just one there, Tim? That's the Chateau Bonnevard in Brittany. Uh, it's on the front cover of the new book where I believe Patrick was taken captive from. Next. Yes, this is the end then. May we end with a blessing for, for all of you. Um, in this story, no one is excluded. So uh, where, wherever you come from, whoever you are, and whatever your views are um, about the, this subject, may the blessing of God and the blessing of St. Patrick be with you all. Very much, Marcus. The process of learning is to expand the mind and consider all possibilities, and I think you really have done that in terms of looking at the hagiography and, and histori historiography and the annals, um, genealogy. You've done the whole thing. <laughs> done a bit. You've done the whole thing, and you've mapped out what you know all the possibilities. Do we have any questions? Sorry. Um, yeah, from Patrick's letters, uh, Patrick sort of accuses him of being a phony Christian, doesn't he? Yeah. 